Hello, and welcome to SDSU Global Campus. Global Campus is designed to expand access to San Diego State University's renowned academics to all learners everywhere, no matter the approach to education. From bachelor's degree completion programs to online masters, to career training and lifelong learning, Global Campus is making SDSU more flexible, accessible, and practical for today's students. If you're passionate about regulatory compliance and bringing safe products to market, San Diego State University can help you move your career in quality management forward. Our new advanced certificate in biomedical quality systems is a four course graduate level certificate program with a specialization in the biomedical and healthcare industries. And it is my pleasure at this point to introduce the speaker for this session, Dr. Gurpreet Singh. Dr. Singh is an international award-winning thought leader, consultant, entrepreneur, author, coach, and educator. He is the program director of quality management programs at SDSU. In addition, he is also a visiting professor at Rutgers Business School, Rutgers University, New Jersey, and teaches various MBA, MS, and executive MBA courses in the field of Lean Six Sigma and supply chain management. He is also a visiting professor for Georgetown University, DC, and University of San Diego. He is the recipient of ASQ Armand Feigenbaum Medal for 2015. Further, Dr. Singh is an ASQ Certified Master Black Belt, designated by ASQ, a distinction held by very few people around the globe. And Dr. Singh was also included in the list of ASQ Fresh Faces, one of the 40 quality professionals from the globe. He is also the founder and head of consulting firm Strategic Supply Chain and Six Sigma Consulting LLC. In this role, Dr. Singh serves as subject matter expert on various functions within supply chain management and provides consulting services, provides coaching and training in the field of operational excellence, business planning, Lean Six Sigma methodologies, procurement, change management, and organizational redesign. Dr. Singh completed his PhD from Rutgers Business School with an emphasis on supply chain management and Lean Six Sigma. And prior to this, he had an MBA from Rutgers Business School with a dual concentration in supply chain management and strategic management. In the past, his efforts in the field of education, he was honored with ISM Education Person of the Year Award in 2009 and the Ray Clapton CPM Award in 2010. Dr. Singh is also honored with ISM J. Terry Leadership Person of the Year, and this was in 2014. Dr. Singh also received the Dean's Award for Excellence in Teaching and Service by Dean of Rutgers Business School in 2017. He was also nominated for California State University Presidential Outstanding Professor Award in 2018. And Dr. Singh has led countless breakthrough projects in various sectors and has proven a record amount of achieving considerable savings while streamlining the process and focusing on change management. He has developed a multifaceted focus on cost savings and process involvement by eliminating waste and has saved millions of dollars for his clients. Dr. Gurpreet Singh has a passion to share his knowledge with the students and is also invited to present seminars as a keynote speaker and has been invited to several conferences across the nation. He has also authored articles for several organizations and is writing two books that are coming out soon. So without further ado, we'll hear from Dr. Singh. Well, thank you, Sydney, for a very kind and long introduction. Uh, and I'll, I'll try to live up to all the kind words that you spoke about me. Uh, and to everybody else listening to uh, me and watching me right now, a very warm welcome uh, on behalf of San Diego State University uh, and the global campus of uh, San Diego State University. As Sydney mentioned, my name is Gurpreet Singh and I'm the program director for the quality programs at SDSU. Uh, and uh, it's, my, it's my honor and pleasure to welcome you all to the 2021 ASQ World Conference uh, on Quality Improvement. Uh, 
uh, you know, generally uh, we, we get to meet you in person every year. And uh, as we all know, because of the 45 minutes to uh, with each of you talking about a topic that is very near and dear to my heart, uh, a topic that I've been researching for the last several years, uh, very, very, you know, foundational topic, yet uh, a topic that, you know, I think uh, companies and organizations still need to take seriously. And the topic is cost of poor quality. And that's what we're going to, you know, discuss uh, for for next uh, few few minutes. So uh, here's my contact information in case uh, you know you have any follow up questions uh, for me after you uh, watch this presentation. That's my email address right there. Both my STSU and my consulting firm uh, email address, and also here's a, a link uh, to the uh, web page of the certificate that Sydney was uh, you know talking about just a minute ago as well as my company web page and my LinkedIn profile. Uh, with that said, the agenda really is very brief uh, and yet I think it's gonna take a little bit longer time than what we have. We're going to talk about cost of quality, uh, various categories within the cost of quality. And then I'll talk about cost of poor quality. So there is cost of quality uh, that encompasses cost of good quality as well as cost of poor quality. And really I'm going to focus more on cost of poor quality today, okay? And uh, once we do that, then, uh, you know, I like to spend a majority of the time on some, some of the case studies. I have two or three, we'll see how the time goes. Uh, if we have enough time, then I like to cover all three. If we don't have time, then maybe, you know, we'll just spend uh, time on one of the three. And, uh, you know, maybe in future, we'll, we'll, we'll spend time on the other two, all right? So with that, let's get started. So in cost of quality, uh, there are four different types of cost. And I'm hoping some of you already are aware of these, uh, but those four costs are appraisal cost, prevention cost, internal failure, and external failure. And so I'm gonna wear my professor hat for the next five or six minutes and kind of you know walk you through these four in a lecture format, if I may. So let's talk about the appraisal costs. So what are the appraisal costs? Appraisal costs really are, the cost, the expenses that are involved in the inspection process. So think of, uh, you know, QA, UT, calibration process, black box testing, uh, code inspection, design reviews, anything that involves inspection, you know, uh, goes into the uh, appraisal cost. So appraisal is a necessary part in the cost of quality. Interestingly, certain elements of appraisal cost are considered to be cost of good quality. At the same time, certain elements of appraisal cost could be considered as cost of poor quality. And we'll talk about that in a, in a, in a couple of minutes, you know, but let me first you know, walk you through uh, all the different costs. So let's talk about the prevention cost. Prevention cost is activities that, uh, you know, the whole purpose of uh, all those activities is to, as the name suggests, prevent the failure, okay? So think about all the training, you know, if you hire an individual or if you are one of those individuals who just got hired and, you know, the company is making you go through all those boring trainings, but there's a purpose for that, right? Uh, you know, all the uh, requirement analysis that your you know, engineering team or your clients or customers, whatever the situation may be, you know, the time spent on that, the requirements uh, analysis, you know, is part of prevention cost. Accurate specification drafting, uh, product reviews, you know, when you get a new product and, you know, you're doing reviews of that product, you know, there's time spent, resources, uh, you know, exhausted on that. Again, prevention cost. Any process improvement projects. They're all part of prevention cost. Any planning activities, prevention cost. So think about it. You know, any, anything to do with Six Sigma activities, anything to do with lean activities, quality management mindset is all going into prevention costs. So let me give you a second to think about what do you think is prevention cost, cost of good quality or cost of poor quality? Yeah, it is, you know, for those of you who are thinking it's cost of good quality, prevention cost is 
cost of good quality or cost of preventing uh, quality expenses to go above. If a company, if an organization spends money on prevention cost, the whole idea is that we'll end up spending less money on internal and external failure, okay? So theoretically speaking, so, you know, this is coming from someone who spent decades, a couple of decades in industry. I still consult on the side. And then for the last 10 years or 11 years now, I've been teaching. And so, you know, a practitioner who decided to become an academician, you know, so I'm saying theoretically for an organization, prevention cost, this category should be the highest percentage wise. Practically, unfortunately, that is hardly the case. Practically, if I look at these four categories, more likely than not, most of the organizations that I've worked for or consulted for, they end up spending majority of their quality cost in, any guesses? You know, if we were doing it face to face, I'll probably ask you guys to, you know, speak out loud. But for those of you who are guessing external failure, you're absolutely right. Most of the companies end up spending money on the external failure cost. When theoretically, most of the money should be spent on prevention cost, followed by appraisal cost. And theoretically, the idea is very little money should be spent on internal and no money should be spent on external, right? That's a theory. Practically, it's the other way around, okay? So let's talk about internal failure. You know, as the name suggests, failure or cost incurred when a failure occurs in-house, the product and or services have not been delivered to the external client, external, you know, uh, customer. So why do we still have cost, you know? Because we still have to do rework. We still have to deal with scrap. Uh, we still have to, you know, deal with opportunity cost of late shipment because of all the rework and so forth, right? We still have to deal with the direct cost of late shipment. So internal cost is still expensive. However, however, like I just said a minute ago, the most expensive is the external failure because in this case, friends, the product and or service has already been delivered to the external client, to the external uh, customer, okay? So what are we dealing with in this case? We're dealing with refunds. Ask any company, ask yourself, you know, almost uh, any organization that I, you know, consult for, at some point of time, they end up asking me, hey, Gurpreet, do you have any uh, experience dealing with returns and recalls? I'm like, yeah, that's kind of, you know, what I do all the time, right? So returns and refunds because of those returns, recalls, whether it's, you know, product uh, defect recall or voluntary recall, and we're gonna spend a lot of time on that in the next few minutes, okay? Uh, then uh, warranty cost, liability cost, lost sales, uh, lost customer goodwill, uh, public relation cost to soften the bad reviews, especially in today's day and age when social media is the king, uh, or queen when, you know, you have Instagram, Facebook, uh, TikTok, and, you know, you name it, forget LinkedIn, but, you know, so many other ways where, you know, uh, news spread around, especially the bad one, like fire in minutes, you can't, you know, uh, risk your company with the external failure. Okay, so that's, uh, you know, the four categories of quality cost. And I already told you theoretically, which one should be the highest, which one should be lowest and practically, you know, what happens. So let's talk a little bit more about external failure. Uh, so in external failure, as you can see, you know, as you keep on going, looking at your screen, as you keep on going more towards the right, you know, when you own your, uh, when you own the process, impact on the company is very minor, but as you keep on moving towards the right, at the end of this slide, when you see end users and, you know, that's when you're dealing with warranty, recall, loss of market share, goodwill reputation, and that's where the impact on the company is really, really bad. And that's, you know, where we have the highest COPQ. Now there are formulas to calculate COPQ. There are different theories, and I'll, you know, talk about the evolution of COPQ. That's not what I'm, you know, here to talk about today. There are so many different articles, journal articles, uh, practitioner articles. And, you know, again, if you send me an email after uh, this, ASQ has a lot of resources. Uh, my 
Uh, the purpose of my discussion today is really to give you some insight on how our company is doing, even after knowing about these things for so many years, right? COPQ, cost of poor quality. Uh, and let's talk about evolution of cost of poor quality. You know, Joseph Duran, he started discussion on cost associated with quality back in 1950. So go figure, more than 70 years ago. Then Harrington in 1980s, he defined COPQ. He defined COPQ as all the cost incurred to help the employee do the job right every time. And costs are determining if the output is acceptable. Plus any cost incurred by the company and the customer because the output did not meet specifications and or customer expectations. So he brought in this idea of specs and customer expectations, okay? Then in 1990s, 1998 or so, so close to 2000s, Armand Feigenbaum, God rest his soul in peace, he classified costs into four categories. Okay, so the four categories that we just, you know, looked into. Then Sorvist in 2001 defined COPQ as uh, the total losses caused by products and processes of a company not being perfect. So now, you know, he started thinking about company being perfect. Then Bugman and Clefso in 2010, uh, they, they talked about customer needs to customer satisfaction, think Cano analysis. And if you, you know, have not read Cano analysis, I highly recommend, you know, you know, review Cano analysis outside the scope of our discussion today. Anyway, so they stated that the quality cost the way we use them today are not the right terms. So as you can see, over the last 60, 70 years, there has been a lot of discussion on COPQ. I'm not the first one. And you know, I'm gonna include a couple of other slides here because just to demonstrate that this is a very common topic. This is not a new topic. This has been around for more than 60, 70 years. So you know, there's a one 10 hundred rule that one unit spent on prevention will save 10 units on correction. Uh, appraisal, and then that will save 100 units on failure cost, right? So when you look at something like this, purely logical, purely rational. Uh, so the companies should, you know, take this and spend money on prevention and should not wait on failure, right? It makes perfect sense. We'll see in a few minutes if the companies do that or not, okay? Um, so now we know, you know, what COPQ is. We know COPQ is primarily internal failure, primarily external failure and bits and pieces of appraisal cost. Why does it matter? Well, it matters because if we can reduce COPQ, it reduces or it impacts the budget directly. How? Think about it. Cost of poor quality hits both the top line and the bottom line, right? How does it does that? If you are able to reduce the cost of poor quality, you know, just the way I explained a minute ago, you're not going to deal with any returns. Again, theoretically speaking, right? You may be able to reduce the returns. So if you're reducing the returns, you know, you are uh, impacting your uh, bottom line. At the same time, you may be able to also, you know, focus on your PR cost, your opportunity cost, and you may be able to hit the top line, right? Uh, you have the incentive to do it right the first time. Uh, it promotes morale and productivity. Uh, like I said earlier, with the PR cost, you can't risk in today's day and age. And you know, I'll show you uh, the famous COPQ iceberg. Again, some of you might have already seen this. You know, most of the cost of poor quality are actually hidden. 15 to 25% of the sales, they are indirect cost of poor quality. So look at the excessive employee turnover, uh, late delivery, expedition of cost, more setups. All of these costs, they are hidden. They are direct cost of poor quality, you know, warranty and customer return and so forth. So altogether, you are impacting both top and bottom line. That's why COPQ is really, really important, okay? let's see how the companies are doing with COPQ. And we're gonna again go back to 20th century. We're gonna go back to, you know, 1960s and 70s, and then we'll come back to the 21st century. Okay, so let's, let's talk about uh, what have companies learned because companies know COPQ, you know. Duran has, God bless his you know, soul in peace. He was around in, in, in the 20th century. So, you know, the companies I'm going to talk about they knew what Duran taught. Uh, they knew, you know, Armand Feigenbaum. They knew Crosby. 
Uh, but let's see what companies have there is. Now it's gone. All right, let's start with Ford. And in Ford, I'm going to uh, give you the example of Ford Pinto. So let's go in the time capsule and let's go back to 1968. In 1968, in the United States, uh, this was how the small car market looked like. So you had VW, Beetle, Rabbit, you had Datsun, which is known as Nissan, you had Toyota Corolla, you had Honda Civic. That was a small car market back in 1968. So Ford decided to launch a car to compete with these you know, four cars in small car market. Lee Iacocca, uh, again, God rest his soul in peace, you know, he was the one who uh, is given credit to launch uh, the famous Mustang, okay? He was the CEO of Ford Mustang back, back in the days, and he gave the target to have Ford Pinto in the showrooms by 1971 model introductions, okay? So why is that important? It is important because the idea was that in less than two years or 2.25 years, the car had to be launched from conception of the idea, which was unheard of back in the days, okay? It generally used to take about four years in, in that time frame. Number two, he set $2,000 for the cost as a target and 2,000 pounds as a weight. Those were the constraints. And we'll talk about why those constraints matter to us, okay? Safety, you know, for those of you who, uh, you know, drove cars back in the 60s and 70s or uh, who drive, you know, muscle cars from that time frame today, uh, you know, I'm a petrol head, so I, I love to drive, you know, cars from that time frame. Uh, I used to drive a Mustang. Uh, safety was never a concern back then. You know, safety really became important in the 1970s. We'll talk about that also in a minute. So it was not a huge concern. Uh, so the issue uh, really was that, you know, shortest production planning period, four years versus two, 2.25 years. Uh, within that tooling, had a fixed time frame of about 18 months. So if you take out tooling, you're talking about six months to manufacture the car, you know, which is really unheard of back in the days. Um, so there were some tests done, okay? Uh, the tests were done for Ford Pinto uh, because there was, you know, this Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Standard 301 that was proposed in 1968. However, that was never implemented for almost 10 years. And we'll talk about it, why it was not implemented in a few minutes. So Ford had an issue with their standard tank design. And, you know, out of all the tests that Ford did, it failed majority of the test. And even then, Ford decided to go ahead with the car. And I'll show you the issue in a minute. Let's take a look at this video. I'm gonna play this video. Uh, so just a, a quick uh, commentary on the video that you're going to watch. It's a very short video. As you can see, I'm, I'm going to play less than two minutes. The car that is going to hit the car is actually Impala, uh, but the car that is going to be hit from the rear, that's the Pinto, okay? So let's take a look. So as you can see, Impala hits the Pinto in the front. Uh, it's the Pinto that caught fire, not the Impala. You know, it's a, it's a crash test, so don't worry. In this particular case, no one got hurt because it was a crash test, and so everything is fine. However, unfortunately, as you're watching this, uh, uh, you know, back in the 60s, when this test was conducted several times, uh, and eventually, when you know, people started driving the cars, people were hurt, people died. And what, what's happening right now is that you're, you're noticing that the doors are not opening because when Pinto will catch fire, uh, the doors, the seals will get heated up. And, you know, unfortunately, even if someone wanted to open the door from inside, they won't be able to open the door. As a result of that, Pinto got the name of death trap. You know, very unfortunate. So that was the issue. So 40 plus uh, vehicles were tested to rear impacts. Unfortunately, 
all except three failed. Okay, why did they fail? They failed because the fuel tank location was causing uh, the fuel tank uh, to you know crash, and uh, eventually, as you saw in that video, the, the Pinto, the test vehicle, would catch fire. So, what do you think? What do you think Ford did back in the sixties, late sixties, early seventies? Do you think they they root cause analyze and they figure out a way to replace the fuel tank or do something? Yeah, it's a, it's a good company. Back then also, it was a great company. You know, they made Mustang. So they came up with a couple of different, you know, solutions. You know, either have some sort of a, a tank bladder uh, or relocate the tank design. However, all these redesign, you know, issues, you know, they were costing them slight money, as you can see on my, see, see on my slide, you know. The main issue, the main issue, however, was timing. Lee Iacocca and Ford leadership team was very, very serious about only one thing. They wanted the vehicle, the Ford Pinto, to be in the market by 1971, okay? And if they had to do any of these changes, Ford Pinto would have uh, delayed the launch for the 1971 market. So as a result, um, and I'm going to skip through a couple of these slides and, you know, just couple of highlights here, look at the cost, you know, five to $6 per car. So from perspective of fixing the root cause, fixing the defect, not a lot of money. You know, another alternative, $2.35 per car, you know, uh, one pound in weight. So limit of 2000 pounds. So again, not a big deal, completely doable. Okay. So what did Ford did instead? They conducted a COPQ analysis on what, on what is the life worth? Give you a background, basically in conjunction with the Department of Transportation, they came up with a very detailed calculation on what would be the payout if someone loses their life? What would be the payout if someone loses a limb? So it was very unfortunate. Uh, they, they basically came up with a number of thousand or $200,725 uh, in 1971. And again, this was done in conjunction with DOT. Now, just so you know, this is done every year by DOT. So this is not something that, you know, Ford did out of their way, but yeah, this was started by Ford back then. So it is very unfortunate. So I'm going to skip through a few slides because I see I still have time to go through one more case study. So I, I like to do that. 20 years of proceedings, legal fees, uh, they lobbied federal government for 80 years. So let me, you know, may, stop here and make a point. Remember that, uh, you know, national federal standard 301 that the government wanted to pass in 68. Um, so unfortunately, the government could not because Ford and the other automakers, they lobbied against it for more than 80 years. They avoid the introduction of safety measures. Instead of, you know, uh, just embracing the safety measures, um, they just wanted you know, to lobby against it, which is very unfortunate. And there are some of the legal costs, you know, some of the um, very famous law cases against Ford, you know, if you ever take a law, law class in the US, you must have heard of Grimshaw Gray versus Ford, where uh, the driver, Lily Gray, unfortunately lost life, and the 13-year-old Grimshaw uh, suffered severe permanent disfigurement from the fire in 1970s, 1972. Uh, Grimshaw was awarded two and a half million dollars in compensation and 125 million dollars in punitive damages, but they were overturned in appeal to just three and a half million dollars in punitive damages. Now, it may sound like it's a lot of money, good preet, right? In 1970s, remember, uh, you know, Richard Grimshaw at 13 years suffered severe permanent disfigurement. So money couldn't do anything, you know. Uh, Gray, you know, the, the driver who lost life, uh, was awarded half a million dollars compensation. So again, money cannot do anything and there are lots and lots of law cases. Ford was acquitted, but the damage to the company was incalculable. This was, uh, you know, the quote by uh, Lee Iacocca. Uh, God rest his soul in peace. We, we lost Lee a few years ago. Uh, he, he was a visionary, you know, all things considered, you know, he came with a lot of cars, but in this particular case, uh, I, I think it was just, the hunger for power uh, that, you know, totally uh, led him to ignore the cost of poor quality. Um, and, you know, you, you can go through the, the rest of the stuff and you'll see it was just something that could be totally prevented. 
there is a Mother Jones article uh, which is very famous in this particular case. I have a copy. And again, if anybody wants to take a look at it, uh, just shoot me an email. I'll be happy to share whatever research I've collected uh, on this particular case. Ford was never found guilty of breaking any safety federal or state regulations. Um, in 1978, after almost seven years, the DOT demanded a recall. And after that, you know, there were some changes made. There was also internal memo on benefit analysis, you know, uh, that was sent by Ford to their, uh, their employees. I also have a copy of this, which is very disheartening. Uh, however, over a period of years, Ford has had uh, their share of recalls. Now, remember folks, you know, both who are familiar with the world of quality and those who are rookies to the world of quality, product recalls are part of doing business, okay? COPQ, that's why I was, you know, when I started this presentation, I was saying theore theoretically and practically, there is a huge difference. Practically, whenever we offer a product and or a service, there are going to be, you know, issues. There are always going to be issues. It's all about how you manage those issues, okay? How you manage those external failures. And I think my interest has been more on how the companies have learned from the concept of COPQ. And that's why I'm not focusing so much on, here is the formula of C COPQ. You know, you, you can read through it. And again, if you want more information on the formula and how to calculate COPQ, I'm happy to share that with you. Just shoot me an email after this. But my research, my interest has more been on, you know, how companies, when they have a product recall or a situation that involves external failure, how do they react? You know, uh, okay, best case scenario, have prevention. If you cannot prevent, you have external failure. What do you do then? Okay, and so some companies, you know, they know what to do and some companies, they just don't know what to do. And, you know, let's go through another one real quick. You know, GM, uh, this is the uh, quote from the CEO of GM, Mary Barra in 2015. You know, let's give credit where it, where it is due to GM, one of the three uh, American car manufacturers back then, because now they're four, Tesla is one of them. Um, they hired a woman CEO for the first time, okay? But what was she doing? She was apologizing to the Congress, to the Senate, and to the American people uh, because people died and people were hurt in their cars, right? So what did they do? You know, this is a picture of uh, one of the engineers Mark Hood, who's showing the ignition assembly. The issue was G GM cars, General Motors cars, they'll be driving at 60, 70, 80, whatever miles per hour, depending on which state you are. Uh, you know, California, Texas, of course, we drive at a little bit higher speed because of the highway uh, limits uh, versus East Coast. But anyway, you know, we are driving at really high speed and boom, you know, ignition goes to off. And for years, GM kept on saying, it is not their fault. It is because of all the keys that we used to have on the you know, key ring, and that will bring the ignition switch from on to the off position, okay? In this particular case, there were engineers of GM who kept on saying, something is wrong, we can fix it. And GM leadership said, shh, right? So again, totally preventable, totally preventable COPQ. What did we do? We went for external failure. What did we do then? We again went for more and more external failure. How, you know, you're going to have these slides. So I'm going to just, you know, go through the slide, which is most important. Uh, look at this one. April 2014, GM fined $28,000 by NSTSA. NSTSA is National Highway Traffic Safety Admin for failure to provide information regarding the recall by April 3rd deadline. May 16, a couple of weeks later in the same year, GM fined $35 million by the DOT for delaying the recall of defective cars they had recalled earlier in 2014. A year later, September 2015, GM fined $900 million by the Department of Justice for concealing the ignition defects that may have led to 169 deaths. Another $575 million expected to be spent on civil lawsuits, which are still ongoing for the last six, seven years. Can, can you imagine 
this could have been easily, easily uh, prevented uh, if they would have replaced, you know, the piece that I showed you earlier in the slides. Uh, and that piece would have cost 57 cents per unit for all the cars, about $1.25 million. Okay, let's throw in the cost for labor, you know, because when we go for a recall to the dealership, GM has to, you know, suck it up. Another two, three, maybe $500 million, right? But these people who lost their lives, they would have survived today. And look at the number. And these numbers, mind you, are going up and up and up every year. And that's how, you know, uh, COPO cost, COPQ costs are going up. So it is, it is very unfortunate. Let me give you, you know, I'm looking at the time. Uh, we, we still have five minutes. So let me give you a couple of other companies just so you know, it's not just the auto industry that is, you know, messing up. So there's, there was a company called PCA, Peanut Corporation of America. Let's see if we can play the video for this one. We are getting used to executives refusing to take responsibility for what their companies have done. But this is pretty outrageous. Today, we learned that an elderly woman in Ohio has died from salmonella poisoning and the ninth victim of an outbreak linked to tainted peanuts. 600 people have been sickened in total. And yet when the president of the Peanut Corporation of America, Stuart Parnell, faced lawmakers today on Capitol Hill, he wouldn't even respond to charges that he sent out peanuts he knew were contaminated. Listen to this. This container is full of products that uh, less than a month ago, people were consuming thinking it was fine to eat. And, and one of the things I'm going to do today is ask Mr. Parnell from the Peanut Corporation of America if he'd like to open this and sample some of the products that he didn't think were a problem in sending out for the rest of us to eat. Now there's some recalled products in here and there are some that uh, probably okay now. Lives were lost and people were sickened because they took a chance and I believe knowingly shipping product that was contaminated. Okay, no real surprise here, but that got no response at all from Mr. Parnell. So Representative Greg Walden tried a more direct approach. Mr. Parnell, did you or any officials at the Peanut Corporation of America ever place food products into the interstate commerce that you knew to be contaminated with salmonella? Well, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, on the advice of my counsel, I respectfully decline to answer your question based on the protection afforded me under the United States Constitution. It's unbelievable. And that wasn't the only time Parnell and his plant manager took the fifth. Mr. Parnell. Is it your intent to refuse to answer all of our questions today based on your right against self-incrimination afforded against you, afforded to you under the Fifth Amendment of the Constitution? Yes. Mr. Leitze, is it your intention to refuse to answer all our questions today based on the right against self-incrimination afforded to you under the Fifth Amendment of the Constitution? Yes. All right, then I have no choice but to uh, both of you are dismissed. At this time, you're subject to the right of the subcommittee to recall you at a later time and date if necessary. You're dismissed. They didn't right. answer. So let me stop here. So in this case, you know, uh, both the brothers, they actually were found guilty. Uh, you know, I hope some of you remember this, uh, you know, peanut issue that we had in uh, 2007, eight and nine again. Uh, his industry background, the recall problem. So again, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip through all of these and, uh, you know, just give you some highlights. In this particular case, folks, there were implications throughout the industry. So many people, a lot of people in the U.S., they stopped buying anything that contained peanuts because they just thought, you know, it's just a ripple effect that anything that had peanut may have some sort of, uh, you, you know, containment. So, uh, not just this peanut corporation of America, but a lot of other, uh, you know, manufacturers, they lost their market share. Uh, the former president, uh, Obama, he had to make a statement that, you know, his daughters, they eat uh, peanut butter sandwich for lunch and uh, he has to worry about it. That's not right. So $1 billion uh, loss. PCA was shut down. The, the, the company that we were talking about filed for chapter seven. The owner, uh, and his brother, who both took, uh, you know, the Fifth Amendment, uh, they were convicted 
uh, they are in the prison, uh, you know, facing up to 30 years in prison. I think they're on the third appeal right now. Uh, the QA manager, uh, she was convicted and the plant manager pleaded guilty and testified against the previous three. Uh, and so did the operations manager. So, you know, whenever I share this case study, I tell my students, you know, if you're working as a QA manager, plant manager, operations manager, uh, procurement manager, don't just keep on signing on everything because the law uh, is going to hold you accountable. Don't look on the other side and just do what your boss is telling you to do because you are responsible for whatever you sign on. And this particular case study is a very good reminder of that. Uh, it is also another demonstration of how organizations, big or small, any sector, they just take quality for granted. And fortunately, we are in a uh, country where you cannot take quality for granted. And you know, it is our responsibility, uh, being the ASQ steward, that we have to spread uh, this mindset, the quality mindset, as a virus across the globe. You know, we have people, and I hope I have you know listeners and people right now watching me from other parts of the world. Uh, so I request you to take this quality mindset wherever you are whether it's you know, China, India, South America, the Africas, the EMEAs, but take this quality mindset. And we, we really need to spread this quality mindset, uh, get rid of the virus that we have right now and rather spread the quality virus because you know, it's really important uh, to start thinking of COPQ in a different light. You know, unfortunately, when I consult for several companies, they think of quality, COPQ or many other quality tools as just a checkbox, quality assurance, keep on checking and move forward. Folks, we really need to change the mindset. Quality is not a checkbox. Quality is a mindset. Quality is put your, putting yourself in the shoes of the clients, the customers, and asking, is this going to satisfy? Is this going to delight? Think cano analysis. Think what our you, you know, uh, previous gurus of quality taught us. You know, go to ASQ's website, read as much as you can, see what Feigenbaum taught us, see what uh, Crosby and Judan taught us and just change your mindset. Uh, with that, uh, I wanted to share more about Lululemon, but that's okay, we don't have time. So I'll skip this particular case study. So with that, here's my contact information. If you have any questions, any questions related to today's presentation or anything related to quality, quality management, lean Six Sigma, please, please, please write to me. You have my email address here. This is my STSU email address. This is my personal email, email address. Uh, here's my consulting uh, firm website. Here's my LinkedIn profile. It's pretty straightforward. Gurpreet Singh, PhD. Uh, I would also like to take a moment here and take you to the web page of a new certificate that uh, we are offering in STSU. Uh, it's called Advanced Certificate in Biomedical Quality System. And uh, here it is. Uh, it's four courses, 100% online. Uh, we have ASQ certified instructors. I'll be teaching a couple of courses myself. And I have two other instructors who are ASQ fellows. Uh, it has a unique focus on biomedical and healthcare industries. Uh, we are in the process of getting a master's degree uh, approved by the chancellor's office. So pretty soon we'll have a full master's degree in quality management. But for now, we have the certificate program. Uh, some of these four courses you can transfer into the, uh, into the master's degree in regulatory affairs that SDSU offers. And once we have the master's degree in quality uh, approved by the chancellor's office uh, in SDSU, then you'll be able to transfer some of these courses, not all four, but I think three of the four courses into the master's degree. So I, I encourage you uh, to apply. We are starting classes in the fall of 2021, again, completely online. Um, and I hope that I'll see some of you there. Uh, and with that, thank you very much. Uh, Mercy Tanwad, I hope you enjoyed, you know, virtual meeting, and I hope to see some of you at the virtual uh, session, virtual uh, breakout rooms after today. Thanks a lot, thanks a lot, folks.